we spend the entire day hearing about banks, crypto, what does the customer want? Is it in the front? Is it in the back? Let's talk about the evolution of this. So I'm going to start with you, actually. And now you're working at Stereo. So for the people out there that don't know you, quick introduction, who you are, what Stereo is, and what is Stereo's part in this fintech evolution? Uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Anton Kudlai. I'm a, a CEO of Stereo. Uh, just a previous presenter, uh, Misha, he's the co-founder, and I'm the uh, CEO. Uh, so we're a mobile uh, only uh, banking app that uh, we would like to launch in uh, Poland relatively soon. Um, and we have Ukrainian roots. Uh, as Misha explained previously, uh, the founders and shareholders uh, of uh, Stereo, uh, they also operate a very successful uh, neo bank in Ukraine. Great. Um Talk to me, well, Alexander, you can introduce yourself around what well, you work in N26 and our love Atomic, you work at MasterCard, so I think that goes without Correct. introductions. So let's get into it. What part of this evolution is Stereo trying to combat at? What are you trying to create that is fundamentally different? Um, first of all, we see a potential here uh, as there are three 0.5 million Ukrainians mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Poland. Uh, they know and like our product. Uh, in uh, Ukraine, uh, Monobank has uh, an NPS of uh, 70, uh, which uh, shows this uh, uncompromised um, focus on customer experience. And we want to bring this customer experience to the Polish market. N26 has been entering multiple markets. Alex, and started by being one of the first ones to passport and understand this notion of an IBA. What have you seen in that evolution and change? Yeah, so um, N26 operates across 24 markets in Europe, as you said, mm -hmm. um, by now also with multiple local IBANs in different countries, so specifically France, Italy and Spain are big markets for us where we have also local presence and for that also local IBANs. I think one of the most interesting challenges along that way has been that despite there being a lot of harmonization on European regulation and the intention yeah. is very much that it's you know one single area and, 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 and these kind of things, the amount of adjustments necessary to operate a local IBAN, for example, are still very, very high. So mm -hmm. when it comes to differences in onboarding, in payment schemes, um, there is still quite a lot to do before you can really be a main account proposition for customers in different countries across Europe. Um, I think it's very easy to, to offer a sort of secondary account proposition used for, for um, e-commerce, for travel, right? That, that's sort of something where you don't need maybe the local IBAN, you don't need every last payment scheme to get your taxes paid. Um, but if you want to use it as a main account, which is sort of very much what we intend to offer our customers across Europe, you need to invest quite a lot more and the, new, the synergies are lower than they should be. Um, so, you know, for example, the intention of the European regulation is for there not to be IBAN discrimination, but there still is um, 10 yeah, years later. Yeah, and, and when we start talking about onboarding, you, you, like the European can't even get aligned on a digital identity scheme. So you kind of start with a backwards foot looking into it. Thomas, MasterCard, obviously a global presence and seeing that. Do, I hear a bit of you know a local flavor, understanding our local market going in. I hear 24 markets, a massive challenge. Not everybody is the same state of maturity. What are you seeing in the landscape? And what is MasterCard seeing in that evolution and change? So firstly, maybe uh, outside of this topic, let me reveal the secret about this panel, yeah, because it's uh, ah, some, uh, somehow doomed. Okay. There, there, there are two Sh other... Should we, give, should we give them... He had actually had a horrendous car There, there are two, two, two <laughs> other people who, who should uh, come here. Uh, one of them decided to do some sporting activities over weekend, yeah, and he got some uh, sport injury. Uh, <laughs> second one was driving yesterday night uh, here, and he has a, ca a car accident, yeah, so... It's somehow cursed, I would say. On the other hand, we are hey, blessed. Hey, it's not cursed. We have everybody here. It's five o'clock. It's sun shining. It's good. On the other, on the other <laughs> hand, we are blessed a bit by the wheel of fortune because we managed to get to this stage. Yeah. Uh, uh, what we are observing on the on the market in terms of both historical evolution of of, of Polish fintech landscape, uh, but also what we see in uh, uh, in in the region. 
So we see a couple of, of phases, I would say. Yeah? Uh, Poland was quite successful in establishing uh, fintechs, I think, even 20 years ago, probably even before the word fintech has been invented, yeah? because we had M-Bank was that was established as a fintech. We had uh, Blue Media, PayU, Alior uh, set up during the crisis that uh, survived very in innovative com uh, company. But actually, almost none of these managed to um, uh, expand uh, internationally. At the, other, and the, at the other hand, in more mature European, uh, European markets, there was a, a second wave, let's say, of fintechs, uh, like N26, Revolut, Monzo, Moneze, which from the very beginning were set up with an idea of going beyond the borders yeah, to, 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 to other countries or even to other, to other, to other continents. So um, coming back to Polish fintechs, what we see, for some reasons, it may be lack of capital, lack of resources, or maybe lack of courage. Yeah, we didn't manage uh, to create a, 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 a too many fintechs who would be successful uh, going abroad. Yeah, so right now I'm keeping fingers crossed, for instance, for, for, for Stereo, who decided, who decided to come to Poland first. Uh, and I hope that Poland will be a kind of springboard for, for you to, to, to expand to, to, to other regions. So in these services, um how have you looked at, Alexandra, how have you looked at the, the evolution of N26 offering to a client? So when you go into straight to the client, you're trying to offer the most amount of services. We talked about this open banking thing really becoming a thing. We all know that that's really not fully there in the standardization. Where do you see the evolution? Where are you spending your time to try to bring value to that end customer and I guess win this race? Yeah. Well, I think also when I reflect on the last eight, nine years, I think in the mm -hmm. beginning, fintech was a lot about making the relationship with your, let's say, bank easier, right? Yeah. Or it was about how to make it, let's say, cheaper, faster, easier. And that was sort of the main proposition, mm -hmm. right? So you can navigate from your phone. It doesn't cost anything. Um, that is sort of becoming more and more table stakes, right? So sort of over yeah. time, uh, even traditional banks sometimes have an app. Yes, it's clunky and so on. But I mean, in theory, you can use an app from a, from a traditional bank. So I think that what, 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 what needs to happen now and what we are focused on is that next chapter, which is about changing people's relationship with money, not with their bank, right? So um, the vision there being if you have a poor bank experience and the bank holds your money, right, mm -hmm. then you will necessarily have quite a dysfunctional relationship with your money, which it shouldn't be because you're working hard for it. And so... By, we want to sort of improve the, the relationship with money by building a bank that you love and that, that sort of talks a lot about adding value beyond just a, a cheaper current account and easier one to manage, but also how do you budget in a smart way, how do you help customers grow their money, interest-bearing savings, access to equities, um, and, and, and eventually sort of also joint accounts, managing with your partners, with your flatmates, depending on your situation. So I think a very customizable um, way that helps you manage your money sort of in a, in, a, in a better way that takes it to a higher level. Uh, that's a bit how we see the world and how we see the future. How do you see the future? Do you see it differently? You're out there. Because, you know, when I hear that, the, the things that go to me is like, all right, that's banking. So you look at a lot of valuations and, and some of the fintechs, they've plummeted. They can't even keep their treasury accounts properly funded. Their capital reserves might make them lose some of the vast licenses that we're seeing out there. We went from unicorns to, you know, camels or whatever, the next generation of zebras it's, it's supposed to be called. You're, you're building a bet here saying, I'm going to take a current existing market that I understand my clients, 7 million clients, 70% NPS score if my memory doesn't fail me that you just said. On what? How are you going to compete in that evolution? What, what is fundamentally different about what we're bringing now than what perhaps you were bringing with Mono? I, I think, first of all, we shouldn't be focusing only on valuations. Yes, valuation, you know, they reflect many things, but uh, if uh, customers continue to come to, you know, to these applications to, and continue to use these services, I think this is uh, the most important that uh, business uh, brings. Uh, and it's also a demonstration that, you know, these services are valuable to the customers. Uh, and, um, you know, what we, I think what we see in Ukraine, that even, you know, during the war, our services are actually becoming uh, even more important, given that uh, physical access uh, uh, on uh, many occasions uh, is harder in, you know, in uh, this situation. 
Um, with regards to you know the European uh, plans, uh, I think you know for us first of all we uh, need to deliver you know the uh, MVP product, test it and try it. So uh, it is uh, less about you know um, uh, about uh, kind of big uh, big ideas at the moment. Yeah, we we need to first uh, deliver the product. Uh, see uh, how our customers uh, use it, and then adjust it also to uh, to their needs. Thomas, you've been seeing that change in the entire landscape as Mastercard, not only European but global. What have you seen change in business models? Like, has it allowed different things to be built? Has it allowed different unit economics to happen? How, how are you and Mastercard looking at? some of the things that they're sharing. And I, I'd love to hear if it's a minimal viable product or if it's a minimal like lovable product or usable product, because I've seen some MVPs out there that I think we all can cringe about. So I will try to be provocative here. Provocative Please. because uh, my, my colleagues are from fin FinTech space. And I would say that actually, uh, I, I don't see an easy path for tech, FinTech player right, right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I would even uh, uh, risk a statement that uh, FinTech would need to Reinvent, reinvent itself somehow. Was, there's a couple of components of secret sauce for fintechs, uh, which played a role in the past, but I think two were important. Uh, very cheap capital, so it was easy to raise money to, to, for, for an entity to set up and then grow. Mm -hmm. uh, plus also the significant gap between what regular banks were providing to, 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 to customers and what customers were ex expected. So the era of uh, uh, cheap capital has ended or evaporated for at least for, for a couple of, of years, I would say. Uh, and also, increasingly often, I would say that the gap between a value proposition of regular banks versus what clients uh, um, uh, need uh, is somehow closing. Yeah? Uh, just um, looking at the Polish example, yeah? a couple of years ago, it was very easy for a fintech player to come, offering a super slick uh, uh, onboarding process and very cheap FX rates. If not, it's, not gonna, um, it's, it's not the case anymore, yeah, because banks were managed to catch, catch up somehow. Yeah? So definitely, it requires some thinking. Yeah? What, would be the, what should be the next big things for, for fintechs to compete with the, with the, with the players in, in, uh, uh, on, the, on the banking, bank, banking space? Especially during uncertain and turbulent times where the established, well established, established trust started playing a significant role again yeah, in the eyes of the, of the customers. How do you see that? Are you, are you feeling that pressure and that provocation of, you know, you're going to have to be something more than just N26 to make it? No, I mean, it, it, it's basically what I said before, actually, right? I think that it's the, the table stakes are, are, are where they are, mm -hmm. and then it's sort of how do you build on top of that? And I think that even though traditional banking has gone digital, very little has really changed. I think that experiences are still Correct. frustrating as ever. Mm -hmm. and, also and the relationship with money, like you said, yeah. hasn't really fundamentally changed, has it? Be, be, exactly, because the, you know, while they're digital, they don't really consider our modern lifestyle or our social connections, so you don't have chances to really manage your money together with, with the people that you're close to. And so I think the vision there is how, do, how does it move from a single-player banking to sort of a multiplayer banking over time, right? So, and that's based on flexible infrastructure, the, that sort of innovation that I think also you can't, you know, yes, a traditional bank can offer an app, okay, fine, but sort of can they really innovate in the back end to deliver a value proposition that is taking things to the next level and really helps you to improve your relationship with money? That's where I think that it won't happen. And the other thing is that is underestimated from my perspective is the power of brand as well, right? Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, removing yourself from that legacy and just starting a new bank and starting a way that you interact with customers on eye level, that you build a bank that the world, that, that people actually love or a brand that they would be excited about, mm -hmm. um, comes together with a good product and is something that, that I think is where the excellent fintechs would still stand out in a B2C space. Um, so those, I think, you know, continued product innovation and a brand that ladder up to that relationship with money, I think is sort of our view of how to not, uh, yeah, fall behind in prediction. I also think there is value and there is a power of organizations and the, you know, successful fintech organizations, uh, I think, operate differently and in terms of their approach 
to innovation, to the speed of innovation, uh, to the you know to the development of the product that is uh, really needed by the customers. I think is is different, and this what should you know continue to make them successful and to allow them to you know to uh, not fall behind. Um, so. Yeah, that. What, what's really different, like in, in a very practical, short way, like it, it, you're, you're talking about building not only your business model for partnerships to be able to bring to clients, but you talked about something fundamentally, which to me smells like culture. Yes, and culture, and you know, you, you fundamentally have only one uh, channel that you communicate with the customer, and you need to make this channel perfect, mm -hmm. and you are better in this channel than usually all of your competitors. And I think this is uh, what differentiates these businesses from, you know, banks that, you know, still has, uh, still have other channels that they need to address. Uh, and, uh, you know, because of this, they also have uh, much more complicated business models. But I would agree organizationally that that's sort of the Probably what, what we are doing, at least I can speak for, for us, we, we build a company that's very comparable to like the best tech companies in the world from mm -hmm. you know, the people that work in, in marketing and product and so on. It's usually not your traditional banker, sort of, right? And, and so you bring a new perspective, you, you question things. So, so that is the, I think, organizational recipe as well. How do you combine the, the necessary knowledge and expertise naturally to, to navigate within the banking landscape, but combine that with people who've built the best consumer products in the world, right, from a brand and product perspective, um, in sort of that fast-paced environment so you can, you know, adapt to change, be really customer-focused and so on. So I, I, I totally think there's a cultural component. Yeah, so I, I would say that probably um, uh, culture and way of, uh, way of working, which allows you to be more creative, more prone to take additional amount of risk, which uh, regular banks uh, would be heavy, uh, hesitant to, 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 to absorb, uh, and uh, ability to act quick, quicker. Yeah? This is probably something what still makes fintechs continuously unique. Yeah? Is the regulator there to follow along? Is the conversation with the regulatory landscape of all this innovation and culture that we're talking about there for you guys when you look at your European expansions? So I think that when we got our banking license in 2016 and we mm -hmm. applied in 2015, there was um, a very good dialogue into, for example, I think the biggest change that we pioneered for the fintech space was cloud. Yeah. So we were the first sort of bank to actually host in the cloud and that process of getting the regulators on board, I mean, but they were open and curious and I remember we had a meeting and there were 15 of the regulators and they were sort of, we were explaining cloud. Um, and, and now it's sort of almost table stakes for, for, for banks and fintechs. So I think that was one example where I think there was a decision made, one banking license that was granted first time in a long time when it was actually based on cloud, based on sort of new technology. So I think that they embraced that, you know, this is happening. And then we were there at that point in time. And, and, and so that was, I think, one of the first steps on the IT side. Um, as I mentioned in my introductory statement, I think the harmonization across markets is not where it needs to be. Mm -hmm in terms of standards of, of, of payment standards, KYC standards and the like, where there are these European directives and then still every country implements them Correct. differently. Um, and then so. you have your poor clients trying to make sense of it all and your brand trying to create a cohesive experience, which yeah. I think it's like really challenging when we talk about product management and managing teams and ways of working. When you're, how, how has your experience been with challenging and change? You know, from my perspective, there are clearly benefits in European regulation. Yeah? Okay. And uh, I think in terms of its standardization, it is still um, you know, above some other markets that we're sure. seeing. So it's you know, all what perspective you are taking. Uh, I think, yes, there, there is probably a lot that can be improved, but uh, it is still at you know, quite developed level. You know, if you look, for example, on PSD2, you know how um, what it brought to this market, I think, you know, it is quite impressive, but it should be further developed and improved. And Thomas, what, what other than the prediction that these guys have to run for their money, come up with really cool, interesting things, and lobby legislation, what, what is MasterCard excited about? 
or worried about? <laughs> Mm, I'm, uh, we are excited yeah, because uh, there is still some some role for 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 fintech for fintechs to play. Yeah? Uh, but um, the ch biggest challenge is probably for me to figure out what would be the next big thing, yeah? the, the, the 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 niche which would allow you to compete with the regular bank. I'm referring to the Polish market, of course, yeah, uh, where we have quite modern uh, um, financial institutions offering the clients liquidity. Uh, efficient processes and um, quite vast uh, array of, 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 of products. Do we have any bets on future? Are we, are we going to win the European market by offering crypto? Or just changing the relationship with money? We'll leave it at that. With that face, I can see the PR teams probably going like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence is... Is your bet. Yes. I, I, at the end of the day, would have a big impact on this uh, industry. So mm -hmm. th that would be my bet. I think it has had an impact in society already. But a bet for another panel. AI, AI, AI crypto metaverse. I don't know. AI crypto met. Can we can we put another buzzword in there? <laughs> No. Machine learning. Ooh, okay. Well, that one is big. Well, with that, I think we're out of time. I could talk to these guys for forever. Clearly, we can get into a conversation about all the other things I wanted to ask you around carbon footprint and all the other stuff. So let's give a warm welcome of applause for them and sharing their perspectives.